All right. Just giving a little stage direction to the Phantom stage directors. How you doing, friends? Ernie here, and this is the final hour of Zero Days to Expiration. That's fi final hour, five days a week, so it's kind of a misnomer. Yeah, it's the final hour on each day. Not the final. A final. Hopefully it makes sense. Ugh. All right, I am set. Oh, thank you very much. Ah, yes. World's strongest coffee. That's good. Fantastic. All right, we're ready to go. So uh, I did not do a trade today, but I do have a... Uh, a correction to make, and that was from Friday, where I said that I, I thought I made a few hundred dollars, but I was wrong. I went to a max loss on that trade, so that's the way that goes. Um, and that all said, I wanted to talk today about becoming a professional trader. If that is your ambition, let me ask you that. Is that your ambition? Do you want to become a professional trader and, and do you know what it actually means? Now, it doesn't, it doesn't really mean that you're working for some proprietary trading firm or an institution or whatever. A professional trader is someone who is trading to support themselves or to not necessarily generate an income, but uh, that, that is their primary means of of uh, and it doesn't even have to be your primary means. It just means that you're doing this. Now, I, I guess, how do you differentiate this from, say, uh, a retail trader? Um, I guess it really, it doesn't mean that uh, you're making money versus not making money. That's generally the case. So um, we can't really put it that way, only because there, uh, there are lots of professional traders that probably don't... Uh, make very much money or, or haven't made money or don't make money one year, but make it other years. So would they be professional and would they have a job? <laughs> you know, I got to wonder about that. But I, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, do you want to have trading be a mainstay of your wealth generation over the next coming years? That's, I guess that's the best way to put it. Because in, in general, you know, even, you know, someone like myself or other people that I know that are, quote, professional traders, they, their trading isn't necessarily their only source of income. And they usually have multiple streams of income, but it might be the primary source or a source. But I, I guess then a, um, whenever, anytime someone is a professional at something, you can differentiate that from someone who is an amateur or a hobbyist. Now, uh, an amateur or a hobbyist, th that may not be their primary source or their, their thing or what they want to be known as, as a trader, right? As a hobbyist, generally hobbies cost money. They don't actually produce wealth. And I think that's what it really comes down to, producing wealth. Uh, and oh, we have uh, we have a comment from the peanut gallery. There's Is. How you doing, Is? And he says, "I do. I want to become a professional trader. What does it take?" Now, I've thought you know about um, become a prof becoming a professional at various things that I, or have had the desire to become a professional at certain things that I never thought. Uh, I would have the capability of doing. Uh, and uh, maybe if I just worked hard enough, I could get there. Now, one of them would, and, and I didn't have enough time to devote to it too. Uh, one would be, uh, when I was younger, I, I played uh, semi-pro ball. And of course, I wanted to become a pro ball player, but uh, that was a, a very elite and select crowd. And the chances of actually becoming a pro ball player and, being gra and graduate to what they call the show, the professional ball field, uh, is slim to none. None. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of players that never get beyond what I did or even higher, higher levels of 
say farm leagues for for the for the show. In fact, I think there's only uh, something like 750 ball players that are at professional status at any one time. I mean, that's crazy. So uh, that that's a very select group. But when you're actually playing in their farm system, you're still a professional. I mean, you're doing that for a living. You're doing that to, that's, that's your thing. The other thing I wanted, I was uh, interested in doing was playing pool. And of course, that was more of, of a hobby. And I, you know, I got fairly good at it, but not at a professional status. And mostly, I think, because I just couldn't devote the time, didn't have the coaching, didn't have the right direction. Hmm. But trading is um, is very different. With trading, you have what you're trying to basically do is take some capital that you're in control of and increase its value. That's the main point. Now, to what degree or how much you increase it by, does that make you a professional? I, I'm not sure. I think it's the way you conduct your, your business. And the the um, the level of effort that you put into it, the the level of discipline, the um, the strategies that you employ, that they are proven, that you're uh, that you have some level of track record, et cetera, all of those things, or that you even keep track of what you do, because there are so many traders out there that might be doing okay, but they have no idea how okay or how poorly that they're doing. And uh, to be a professional at anything, I think, is to, is to try to attain the, the highest level of practice uh, in that particular field and, uh, I, I guess, abide by certain standards that others do. But trading is, is a very different game in terms of applying or being standardized or anything like that. In fact, because there are so many different ways that you could trade, it's hard to put a... Um, a definitive status on someone that says, oh, because they trade this strategy and because they belong to such and such an organization or they have this affiliation, and they have these credentials, then they are professional. No. It, um, it really comes down to, I think, your, your dedication to that craft and the level to which you take it. And that's actually what we're, we're doing here or what I'm attempting to help people do. I want them to get to that level that they feel and they act and they perform as a professional, that they could take this skill and apply it somewhere else and, and do well. Now, uh, trading in of itself is, is one of those one of those occupations that is severely limit it can be severely limited by uh, your ability to be able to concentrate and and um, develop the discipline that you need towards that and have the uh, intestinal fortitude the um, you know the the right um, concentration be mentally prepared all of that stuff so that you can eliminate any of those things that could be distractions from, from what you're trying to do. Now, if trading were just the ability to execute commands or to execute a script, then a lot more traders would be, quote, professionals. And in fact, there's a lot of people out there that are that are professing that their strategy, all you have to do is just follow this and then you can achieve professionalism. Or, uh, you know, here's, here are our alert. And someone that's following alerts, I think, uh, could never become a professional trader because they're, they're basically uh, living off of someone else's work. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, you could hire somebody to create a system for you that generates those alerts and then you trade them. And in a uh, kind of um, systematic combined with discretionary way or a semi-systematic. And uh, that would be perfectly legitimate if you, you know, if you were able to actually make something out of that self-grow and, and, 
have a positive outcome. But um, <clears throat> oh, let's see, what does Milo have to say? I am trying to learn as much as I can so I can supplement my income after retirement in a few years. And that's a, that's a great goal. And so getting to that point where you can do that reliably and consistently year in, year out would absolutely make you a professional trader. I don't think any less so than, than any other person out there. Now, the, the real key, I think, is being able to take all the things that could hamper you from achieving that professional status and be able to actually turn your strategy and your tactics into real wealth, that you could actually take a, um, uh, some bundle of capital and then increase its value over time and then do that consistently. I think that would be probably the best definition of a, of a professional, that um, they can't just be a professional for a few months out of the year. They need to be able to do that year in, year out. So you can't really um, define what professionalism, I guess, until you've achieved at least some level of consistency over time. And that's really the key. Now, <clears throat> a lot of that is definitely dependent upon the strategy that you use. Uh, a great deal of it, I think a great deal more, is dependent upon your ability to be able to apply that strategy and your ability to act like a professional in the same way that you would act in your job in the way you conduct business. It's really no different. The problem with, um, with trading is that it becomes a very egocentric and uh, potentially um, mind-altering activity that, is, um, that, that really tests your, your, um, your intestinal fortitude, your ability to concentrate, your ability to self-improve or to have a kind of continuous improvement mentality and uh, be able to also uh, practice a level of detachment from, from what you're doing compared to you know, what, it, what the outcome is be, can be or, or what you're attempting to do and not get tied up into the weeds of things. That's, uh, that's another very important aspect. So it's, a, it's being able to develop a mindset where you can become a completely objective, detached person and apply a strategy and be able to make the right decisions at the right time. All of that is important. So, <clears throat> so I think that's what uh, uh, really being a, a professional at trading is, is really all about. Now, others might have different ideas of that. That's fine. But in, in my view, it, that, uh, that level of professionalism uh, comes with a, the ability to, to uh, engineer and maintain a process and then also be able to uh, have at the same time that level of objectivity and detachment uh, from, from the thing that you're actually trading. Some people think that, hey, if I could just tr you know, treat trading like a video game, I'd become so great at video games that you know, it doesn't matter what the score is. I can just beat it, you know, as is. Uh, and uh, you have a, I mean, there's no, there's no consequence of losing the game. So you, you go all out, right? But if there were consequences uh, to a game, you might play it very differently. And that's really the, the biggest problem is that uh, with people in attaining that level of concentration and that level of discipline and that ability to create and maintain that process and detachment. <clears throat> is because of the consequences. And um, now, things that can help that, there are things that can help that. Now, first of all, you have to have some level of uh, realism and what you can do with certain types of strategies. The reason why a lot of people are professional traders is because they do things that aren't like what a retail trader does. Uh, particularly the types of strategies that they choose and uh, the way they approach them and their mindset, completely different. 
And that is mostly because they are in different classes and they're, they, they are exposed to different information uh, where the people that are coddling those p professional traders have a different set of goals and sometimes actually in competition with the retail trader. And maybe you don't realize that, but as a retail trader, you are, you are in competition with all the pros out there. And that's not a, uh, that's not a, an enviable place to be when you have people that are trained and skilled, and this is what they do to put bread on their table, and they are trying to kill you monetarily. So you're, you're at a real disadvantage. And they also, have, they also have coaches, mentors, support staff, technicians, and others that are supporting them. Even if they're independent, they, uh, an independent professional trader also has coaches and mentors that they rely on, as, as I do. And this is actually what I try to provide for the people within the service in, in a group way, provide them with coaching, mentoring, and then direction. And then also the proper strategy to use. Now, I think that a lot of people are kind of misinformed about what strategies actually work and what strategies don't work, what strategies give you an opportunity to, or at least um, enough leeway or room for error to be able to be successful, and then other strategies that re really require you to be uh, a, um, a computer, that if you cannot perform like a computer, there's zero chance that you can actually uh, eke out a profit. There is, um, you're also competing actually at the retail level uh, with your broker. Your broker has no interest in, in you making money. They only have one goal in mind, and that is for you to create transactions. And they don't care if you, as long as you create transactions, and if you happen to bust an account and go away, that has absolutely zero consequence on them or, um, you know, some people would may want to sue them, but they're kind of held harmless. Uh, their goal is for you just to trade as often as you can. And so what a lot of people don't realize is that the broker is out there designing systems and spreading information in the, in the form of courses and gurus and other things that are so, and also analysts and a whole range of media and so forth that are designed specifically to get you to do what the broker needs you to do, and that's create transactions, not win. Those are two very, very separate and orthogonal things. And the broker doesn't care if you win or not. In some cases they do, because if you win too much or you hold on to positions too, too long and you hold large positions too long, uh, that ends up costing them. But they, there are few, those people are few and far between, so it's, not, it's a, um, it's something that a broker can handle. Uh, what they're re really relying is on that average retail trader that that comes in and just, you know, lots and lots of transactions. And they want you to do that. And they encourage you to do that through, like I said, education. Virtually all the educational resources that are out there for traders um, are for retail traders. They're not for professionals. The professionals don't go to the bookstore or online or or uh, on the internet to find out how to become a professional trader. Uh, that is usually geared for or supplied by mentors, trainers, uh, institutions, et cetera. They have their own way of doing things and a process that will bring you down a certain path. As, a, as an individual, you could go through that and then go out on your own and, and be able to sort of duplicate that for sure. But uh, you're not going to find that as a retail trader. You know, what are the best strategies to use? What is the best process to, do, to follow? How do I conduct myself uh, as a professional? It's just simply not there. It's not available. There are certain things that are, uh, that are, that are out there that are available. In this age of information, you can find just about everything. Uh, but they're, not, um, they're in short supply or 
there aren't enough people to be able to say, hey, this is what you need, this thing right here, and this is how you have to conduct yourself when you use it. There are so few people out there that actually are out there to, to do that for you because they have no, there's only one reason that they would have interest in, well, there's maybe a, a couple of related reasons. I mean, I have my reasons that I enjoy uh, helping people become all that they can be. I've been a coach and a mentor and a leader in organizations for 40 years. So that's what I like to do. So I like to take what I've learned on the professional circuit and then help others attain the best possible person that, or worker or trader or business person or whatever they are doing, the best one that they can possibly be. Why do people, everybody knows that I'm busy. Oh, now I know that this is not professional. Hold on. Hello? Yeah, this is Ernie, and I knew it was you, except that I am super busy right now. Are the, are the, are the, um, is the framing all done? Awesome. Uh, so uh, what are your hours? Okay, we'll probably be done Saturday. Thank you. You too, bye. All right, I knew I had to take that call, and uh, I'll let you know what it is. Uh, we, uh, we bought a lot of artwork when we were on vacation on Martha's Vineyard, and some of it needed to be framed, and so that was the framing company. <laughs> and uh, I knew if I didn't take that call and find out exactly when to go and pick it up, um, I would be chasing it or I'd forget about it. So that's one thing about being a pro, I think, is that... Uh, when you're confronted with something, you need to handle it right then and there. So what I was saying is that uh, the, the brokers, they've set up a, a system, a, an environment that helps you help them make money. And that's what all, virtually all retail traders follow. They follow this system that has been perpetuated by brokers. And they continue to do that. It, it is, in some sense, a kind of conspiracy, uh, for sure. Uh, there is a uh, conflict of interest there, for instance, uh, when you have brokers and the analysts that work for them, they go on to uh, big talking head financial networks, and they profess or they pump up certain stocks. They're not doing it because they're trying to help you. Or I mean, the reason why they put them out there is so that they can get activity going and so that you'll push buttons. So, uh, and, and it's really kind of distressing too. I mean, I've been involved in that industry at that level with the brokers, helped some of the initial brokers actually get online, um, led teams that built all the systems that they used, uh, worked with their engineering and marketing and management and everybody else and their, and their vendors to put all that, te that tech together so that you could get out there and trade. So I've got a, you know, firsthand information, firsthand experience with how all this stuff works. And uh, as a retail trader, <clears throat> you're, you're, um, you're being held in this carapace, a kind of shell that uh, is impenetrable to what the pros see. And there is a thick dividing wall between what you do and what the pros do. In fact, almost all strategies that retail traders use are strategies that most pros would never even consider. So uh, in particular, anything that is high probability, anything that is high probability comes with a caveat, and that is that it also has high risk. And of course, you hear everybody talk about your primary objective when you're em employing one of these strategies is to manage your risk. What they're really saying is uh, you need to manage your losses because they know that the long term, in the long term, long run, Unless you have perfect execution, and even if you do have perfect execution, uh, there is a slim margin between being a loser and a winner. And uh, if you have anything less than perfect execution, which is the fact with 98% of all, all traders, you're going to lose. And they recognize that. 
And that's, that's fine. That's fine by them because all they want you to do is do lots of transactions. And, and that's part of the game with high probability strategies that they have you do a lot of transactions, a lot of small transactions. And then every once in a while, you get that sharp, sharp shock of a loser that might wipe out weeks or months of your, of your, um, your wins. And, and you're left feeling that, well, it wasn't, must not have been the strategy because this is pushed by this guru or that guru and he's doing well and that doing well. And I'm just not there yet. I haven't achieved that, that or attained that level that I can start performing like they do. Now, it's true that there are some people out there that are able to take a high probability strategy and make it work. But I can guarantee you that it's not because of the strategy that they're making it work. They're making it work because they happen to be one of the exceptional individuals that might have an intuitive sense of the market. And they can do well regardless of, um, of what strategy that they have. But those people are few and far between. Uh, there are... There are organizations out there that are generally referred to as prop trading firms that are looking for those types of individuals, and they're more than willing. Check, check, mic check. Are you saying that I am uh, not coming through here? Uh, see, I get that, and I'm wondering, you know, can you hear me? I can hear myself. For sure. I've got mics all over the place here. Um, so what I'm saying is that there are, there are certain people that uh, do well no matter what kind of strategy that you, you give them. I mean, they can make hay anywhere. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. They can make hay anywhere. And these prop trading firms, they're looking for people like that. So they're willing to float uh, a lot of people and uh, bring them through their training program and give them capital and let them train uh, for the hopes that they're going to find someone who has promise that will be able to then become part of their team. And so they're looking to build a, uh, a, a team of these highly skilled, extraordinary people that don't near really exist in in the wider sense of retail traders they are they are the exception they are you know they truly are that needle in the haystack they are the one percenters and, and that's what they do so and and a lot of those guys will end up starting services right and uh, they're they're under the well i don't know if they are truly aware or not of whether or not they are, they can take that skill or whatever and then transfer it to others. Um, maybe they can, but I think that that's what uh, most, or at least some of the services that are out there where people have good intent, they want to take what they know and see if they can uh, turn you into them. And um, to some extent, that's, that's kind of like what I do too, but uh, I go a little bit further in that you know, I, I know how to actually build traders and also show you a strategy that uh, is, is a lot more approachable and easy to actually make money from and something that, you know, pros use. And, and so that's what I do. But um, in general, becoming a professional trader is, is really a, a labyrinth. It's, it's very difficult to find the right people and what you actually need. And it certainly isn't an alert service. That's not going to do anything for you. You need, you need somebody that is going to take a true um, interest in your success and your, um, your growth. Someone that will help you be accountable to the things that you, you set out to do. And, and that's primarily what these prop trading firms are, too. They take a true interest. And that's exactly what happens here in this service as well. <laughs> um, I was just reading one of the notes that uh, it wasn't me, it was JD's <laughs> system. <laughs> uh, so uh, th 
that is that is what's actually needed. So in order to become a professional, you need a support service. You need a support system around you, someone that is going to help you navigate through the things that you need to do, the processes that you need to adopt, the skills you need to acquire, and the goals that you need to achieve and keep you, help keep you on that path through that, through that, um, that service of, of keeping you accountable to what you do. Um, now, I know that some of you think, hey, you can do it all on your own, but I don't know of any professional, like I had mentioned, um, you know, being a professional baseball player or even a pool player or, or whatever it is, even, even in industry, no matter what it is, you need some sort of support staff, a coach, a mentor, someone that can help you stay on that path and show you what's the right thing to do. Uh, there is no other, I mean, you're not going to learn that from a course. You're not going to learn that from the vast majority of uh, service operators out there that you never actually interact with in the service. And that's very different from here at zero-DTE. Everybody interacts directly with me. Everybody gets my mobile phone number. Everybody can call me and I answer the phone and I help them through whatever issue that they have. That is what a true mentor and a true coach does. You simply do not get that kind of attention in I. I don't know of any other service that uh, provides that kind of attention. Uh, but if you want to become a professional, the other thing that is important is that uh, the person that's behind that service is actually a professional. That, uh, that they've been there, done that, that they also know the process that you need to go through. And they're also a coach and a mentor that can help you. And I mean, that is what I have been doing for 40 years. Well, as a coach and a mentor, probably closer to 25 years, but uh, I've got a lot of experience. And not only have I trained traders, but I've also trained C-level folk and managers and directors and other people in their respective industries. So... Someone that has that kind of uh, ability and that is totally focused on your success is what will help you become a professional. And it's not something that you can easily find. And so it's one of the reasons why I decided to start this, uh, this whole organization was to help people do exactly that, to help them uh, achieve a level of professionalism that they could be self-sufficient in this. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people are looking for that to happen very quickly, or maybe it's never quick enough. And it can take a while. And I know that, you know, we have some people that get it right away and others that it, it might take a few months and others it might take a year it, um, before they really get it and, or before they get the, uh, the right direction or uh, yeah, I guess it's the right direction and, and inspiration to be able to finally get what they need to do and then do it. The reason why somebody doesn't get to that level isn't necessarily because of the resources that are around them that are providing them with the tools to do it. It's that they, fully, they haven't fully realized what it is that they need to do yet, regardless of how much, that they're, um, how much information is given to them. And, and that's, that's okay, too, because a lot of people receive that information at, uh, at, at different in different ways and also at a different pace. So, uh, and, and that's why I've, you know, I often tell people that, you know, to become successful at something like this takes a long time. And your ability to, uh, to say, grade yourself as a professional doesn't come after, say, a few months of training and a few months of success. It's much more long-term than that. It, it may literally take you years before you realize that, yeah, I think I'm a professional now. It's kind of like that with, uh, like with a martial artist as well. I mean, they go 
through various levels and stages of development, there is a, a Japanese term called shu-ha-ri, which describes that, where shu is the first level or attainment of basic skills and the fundamentals. And it's funny, when, when someone first starts out like that, they could be, say, in martial arts, they could be a white or, or green belt for a long time. And they could get fairly skilled at all these fundamentals. And they feel like, you know, they could whip ass on just about anybody or defend themselves or, or uh, act in the way that uh, the, uh, the philosophy of that particular art demands. Um, or they could just, you know, just think that they're, like I said, just a, a kick-ass person now. But in fact, they are still at that very fundamental level. And it may take them another two, three years before they can advance to some of the more, uh, more advanced belts, like a brown belt or a black belt. And even when you get to a black belt, uh, at that point, you're starting to take on that second level of uh, mastery or attainment of skill or professionalism. And that's ha. So the first was shu and then ha. And ha is the, the ability to now you've mastered all of those fundamentals and now you're uh, you're looking at strategy and implementation and how it all works together how you can take on multiple situations you can be a little bit more creative and express that creativeness there uh, when you're at the shoe level the fundamental level you have no ability you just don't have the depth of experience and it's it's like that with trading too and, and of course, the last level is that level of mastery where you kind of make it your own, right? You've achieved a, a level that's above the strategy and the philosophy level where you now have created your, your own thing uh, that can't be duplicated, that is uniquely yours. So it's the same way with trading. And trading, it could take, you know, a couple of years before you realize, hey, man, I've I've had... I've had 15 solid quarters, All right? And I feel like I've achieved that level. I know all the different situations that I can encounter, or at least most of them, and if they're unknown, I know how to handle them. I've developed a disaster recovery plan. <laughs> Besides my plan for just trying to, you know, be a good steward of my money, uh, I have reverence for my money. Uh, I understand the strategies. I understand that, uh, or I'm starting to realize that the more I find out about the market, the the less I realize I actually know. Uh, those are those levels of realization and attainment of uh, enlightenment uh, only come with a lot of time and a lot of experience, and that's that's where you start becoming a true professional. All right, so now we have. Somebody, JD, wants to know, JD, have you already viewed today's volume profile? I heard you mention you weren't currently in a trade, but you're plan are you planning any last hour trade? Um, today was a, a, a special day, I think. Today was a very difficult day to trade, and it didn't provide a lot of... Um, a lot of opportunity to have a a high probability or a, uh, a high confidence of success. That's what I, I guess that's the way to, I would put it. There's sometimes when, you know, you want to play baseball and you look outside and it's raining and you say, it's just not the day, right? That's the way I viewed today. Today, today was, um, I mean, there, there were probably a number of things that caused today's uh, reversal. And I don't even know if it's going to be sustainable or if we're going into another bear market rally. It could be. Or if it was just some sort of gamma squeeze or if it was a reaction to the, um, the Bank of England dropping this idea of cutting tax rates at the, at the highest level. That, that seemed to be a little bit more political, but I don't know. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't conducive to get out there and try to lay, lay a uh, a strategy down and then have a high confidence that it could have success. You know, most of the time when we're entering the market, I feel like you have a 50, 50 shot. And if we have a 50, 50 shot, 
that's enough for us to make really good money over the long term by the nature of our asymmetry and our risk to reward and also the um, the way we practice our analysis and and our processes so most days are like that today definitely wasn't like that so that's why i didn't trade you know sometimes you just don't uh so hopefully that uh, the answer that answers your question and i haven't even taken a look at it uh for the past let's see let's see what's going on you want to see what's going on one thing that i can tell you right now is that uh, we've passed through now this is pretty incredible look at this we've uh we started down here at 30 set about let's say 3570 and we went as high as 3711 140 point range in a market that is normally going through an expected move of 40 or 50 points so three to four times more than a normal range today uh now, when you're in a market like that, you don't know if uh, that's if you're going straight up or if you're going to go higher, or at any point there's going to be a reversal. Uh, you know, you and your strategy just might not be conducive to that thing. And our strategy isn't conducive to uh, a massive move like this. Now, somebody who might be just trading long options or something, that might be the perfect strategy for them, but not for us. So uh, it, um, and there, there was no telling where it's going to stop. It blasted through an LVL. It blasted through a volume node. And um, it looks like it's stopped there, I think, maybe. So, you know, I would rather not, not dip my toe in those waters. Now, Robert, on the other hand, he said he's in with a five wide at 3660. Five wide. Uh, you know, as narrow a spread as you can possibly get. But he's only paying 15 bucks, so it's like a, a little lottery ticket. 15 bucks to make 240 bucks, right? $235. If you can do that, all the power to you. Uh, that's probably the type of trade that I would I would be okay with. But nothing. But even that is just that's just uh, throwing away money. I mean, you might make something. It might be worth it. It's good risk to reward for sure. So Adam says, hi, Ernie, when or if you make a decision uh, not to place a trade, do you share this recommendation and rationale behind it with the service members? Um, yeah, I think I talked about it a, a great deal. I mean, I, I didn't come to any one conclusion. You know, here's the thing. There's a lot of opportunities for us to take a trade. And those opportunities typically start you know, right after the market opens, obviously. Uh, for most of our trades, we I think we find that those opportunities culminate or are greatest between, say, 10.30 and noontime. And, at 10 and that's one of the reasons why we have a daily strategy meeting right then. At 10.30 to noon, we do our daily Zoom meeting and all the, and the members get together and we, we look at, the market and try to come up with some sort of strategy and there was no conclusion during that meeting at all so you know it, is there some at some point where i say that there is a definitive no go not really because you know after that there have been times when we've taken trades at um, you know from 12 to 1 and 1 to 2 and 2 to 3 and then also the final hour the final hour uh, it has been mostly an experiment but I haven't found a, uh, a single reason to get into the market. I guess if I had, I would have communicated that. But I don't know that I, I also just communicate that there's no good reason. Um, but, but it becomes kind of obvious when you can't find a trade to get into. Uh, and, um, and in doing the analysis that I did over, you know, over the day, um, I think that, I have said that, 
you know, but I don't have, I don't have like a, a go, no go signal about them. I don't, I don't get out there and say, all right, everybody just sit on the hands. We're not doing anything today. Now there, it is possible we could have that kind of situation. I guess it is possible. Like if we have a flash crash or something, I, I would prefer to just sort of sit on the sidelines and, and watch it happen. Uh, but this was kind of a melt up of some sort and um, it was not easily identifiable by what caused it. So, and I couldn't find a place where we could easily get in. I mean, we could speculate different trades, but unless they, uh, they met certain criteria, which they never did, then there's no trade. So I had speculated a trade that, uh, that sat below this volume node that was between 3660 and 3640, somewhere around there. And, uh, and it was kind of contingent when we had this little consolidation here right above 3630 that it would then break through the, the volume node and come back down into this low liquidity area. But it never did that, so therefore there was no trade. Now, would there have been a trade later on? Maybe, but it just kept on going straight up, so I never even saw an opportunity. So that's, you know, that was the, uh, that was the no trade call today. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, if things don't set up, like I said, if uh, if you want to go outside and play baseball and you look outside and it's raining out, you probably make the executive decision not to go out. Now, um, uh, on the other hand, if you're doing some sort of activity that uh, loves the rain or doesn't care, no matter what the condition, like uh, us taking the dogs for a walk, I you know I don't care if it's um, if it's snowing, uh, torrential downpours, a um, hundred degrees nine below uh, we're going out to take those dogs for a walk on a uh, on a nice four mile trail walk uh, right out here right outside my door that's what we do that's one of those strategies that works in all kinds of weather conditions is there a weather condition that wouldn't work or one that we haven't gone through the only time there was one that it was difficult, only because it was physically demanding to get through, and that is uh, during a, um, uh, a huge snowstorm where maybe 10, 15 inches of snow have, have fallen. Uh, try walking through 15 inches of wet snow for four miles. That is, that is tough. <laughs> So uh, usually we will wait until the next day so that we can then put, you know, put on some snowshoes or other things so that we can flatten the trail. That, that is about the only condition there that stops us from walking the dogs. But with trading, I would say that there's far more conditions, uh, far more reasons not to get and put your money at risk. And, and really, that is, that's, again, that's a part of being a professional too, recognizing when the uh, the opportunity isn't there, right? You have, and in order to do that, I said earlier that you need to have some level of detachment from your money and the strategy. But even that, underlying that, in order to do that, you initially have to have a certain reverence for the money that you are putting to work so that you can develop this level of deference and... Uh, rationality and understanding of when it's a good time and when it isn't a good time to put your money to work. And um, I would say, at least in the context of our strategy, our strategy, this was not a good time for us to get out there. Maybe for some other strategy it was, but there are, and, but these things, they don't happen that often either. You know, maybe a handful of times in a year. Maybe a handful of times. That's about it. So um, let me let me just say one thing about being a trader uh, that that anybody can latch onto and uh, develop, uh, but it's not so easy to develop it all on your own. And and that is the ability to be able to 
be obsessed with whatever process that you engage in. See, when you're a professional at anything, it's not so much the winning and uh, the the um, the playing and you know the game to game type of thing. Once you're at the professional level, I mean, maybe at a recreational level, it might be that way. You know, you just love playing the game. But the the truly exceptional professionals, they love the process of getting better. Every little and they have an intense level of uh, competitiveness, and that competitiveness is all about improving every little aspect of their being that makes them better at doing that particular thing. That that is really ultimately, I think, what a professional is. Um, I, uh, and let me let me emphasize that point. They're the people who are truly the best at trading are are those that tend to be hyper competitive. Now, does that mean that you have to be competitive in order to be successful? No, no. But you have to have the dedication to um, improving yourself and perfection, and understanding that there is no such thing as perfection, but there is a such a thing as a path towards perfection. It's a never-ending path. And that is the one thing that, that separates the, the retailer from the professional. The professional will do everything it takes, every conceivable action, every uh, conceivable bit of knowledge or uh, advantage that they can attain uh, in developing their skill, their process, and then they will be obsessed with making it the best they possibly can. And it's one thing, it's a message that I give to everybody in, in the service just about every day. And I go through a very definitive process every day and I try to, you know, shout it out, you know, hey, this is what I'm doing now. Now I'm doing this. Now I'm doing that. Are you doing that? <laughs> And uh, constantly throwing, you know, new information that can build up the body of knowledge and have that drive towards making that process the best you possibly can. See, one of the, one of the frailties that we have as, as humans is our inability to act like computers, <laughs> you know. So if we had a strategy that had definitive uh, profit-making potential, it has a definitive edge if you can execute everything absolutely perfectly. And if we could do that, we could do it. And, but is that the best level of, uh, of perfection for that strategy? Probably not. But at least that's what you've defined uh, as from a computer program that you can uh, let it go. But maybe you haven't uh, put all the variables in it that it's just too complex to put everything like that into the computer. But as humans, we have that ability to expand and be creative and go beyond even the, those basic criteria that we know are, would make a strategy successful. And if we could then take it to that next level and apply that creativeness and go even beyond what a computer could do, but it would require extreme self-discipline and dedication to that process and perfecting that process. That, that would be what it takes to become a professional. Is that what you have? Is that what you want to do? I mean, is that what you want to do in, in virtually any station in life, anything that you take on? Isn't that what you do? You're always looking for a way to get better at that thing. Now, hyper-competitive people, they do that as a matter of course. That's just what they do. Because they're, they're obsessed with being the best, winning. And that means that every little thing that they do contributes to that, that ability to win. And so they want to be the best at every little aspect of that and then put it all together in this nice, smooth, functioning unit. So that's what I would say uh, separates uh, the professional from the amateur or the retailer. And that's what we do here. That's what I encourage people. That's what I, try, that's what I talk about every day in hopes that they will
take up that challenge, that uh, they start understanding or they gain that understanding, that that's what it takes to become truly great at something. That every aspect of it becomes a project or a habit that you have to instill in yourself. And in fact, being a great trader or being great at everything or anything, I should say, is, is nothing more than a series of, of habits, of highly defined habits. And also developing a highly defined or highly structured or um, sophisticated process for improving all those little habits that you have and that series and how it all fits together. That is, in my view, truly what it makes, what it means to be a professional. That you have that kind of attitude, that kind of drive to making everything better. Everything about that thing that you're practicing better. And you can, you know, you can practice this in, in just real life things too, you know, with things as simple as walking the dog or walking along a path and being present in that or making coffee or eating food or just about anything that you do uh, has, has room for perfection. And uh, if you can apply that to one thing, you can apply, apply it to another thing. All right. So uh, I think the... The bell is going to ring real soon. Let's see. What is this going to say? Ernie, you're a treasure trove of good stuff. Thank you for sharing and all you do. You demand. Well, thank you very much. Um, so hopefully, uh, hopefully that answers the question. Do you want to be a professional, a professional trader? Do you have what it takes? Do you have the will to do what it takes. And it's not, when I say, do you have the will, that, that sort of implies that you need to force yourself to do it. A professional doesn't have to force themselves to do anything. They, they do it out of the love of doing it and out of the love of getting better at every little aspect of what they do. And then when, when they get to that point, Everything else falls together, falls in place. Their consistency in, in their profits, their execution, their entry, their management, everything. Everything about it is, is all about getting better at the little bits and pieces that put, up, put that all together. And over time, you start developing this... Uh, this sort of muscle memory, this innateness that some of those more basic things, the shoe out of the shuhari, the shoe starts becoming second nature, muscle memory, um, unconscious. So that when you're doing something, all of those things that you practice become completely natural. And so then you can then focus yourself at that next level of mastery. Aha. And then finally, at some point, the re. So there you go. Hopefully uh, uh, this was helpful to you about what it actually takes to be a professional at something. And um, you would be interested in following that kind of path. There's a link down below. Thank you very much for hanging out with me. And uh, we'll be here. We'll be here for the rest of the week. Literally. <laughs> Peace to you all. Time for the music, man.